Hello, and uh, you're all very welcome to our impact seminar today. And thanks very much for making time to attend. My name is Liam Clear, and I work here at UCD in the area of research analytics and impact. And I have great pleasure in welcoming our speaker today, um, Dr. Gemma Derrick, uh, to this seminar. And uh, Gemma is an Associate Professor for Research Policy and Culture at the University of Bristol. And her work examines the cultural dynamics of research, including the influence of governance and changing criteria on research practice and knowledge production. Her talk today is called Approaching Research Impact from a Cultural Perspective, Its Evaluation and Consequences. And it will explore emerging issues in impact evaluation and their cultural consequences for research. So the talk will last about 40 minutes and will be followed by a kind of a, a questions and answers session. Um, the questions and answers button is enabled on your screen, so you can enter in your questions as we go through um, presentation, and then we can kind of do our best to answer them at the end. So um, I'd like to hand over now to Gemma for a presentation, and uh, thanks again for, for coming along today to, to share all your knowledge with us. Absolute pleasure. Let me just make sure that I... Share the right stream. Liam, is that correct? It's it's cool. Yeah, we're we're in business. We're looking good. Looking good. Brilliant. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me, albeit virtually here, um, to talk to you about the culture of impact and its effect on research culture. Um, I've therefore renamed this presentation just a little bit, um, artistic license, even within a research environment, um, and I've called it impacts impact. And here I'll be talking about impact as an evaluation tool, but also the impact agenda and um, going through a couple of projects that I am finishing up and, and or have recently finished around how impact has, for want of a different word, impacted research culture and some particular ideas about how we can take snippets of research and understand how it's influencing how we, how we conduct research, but also especially important for research governance, how we um, evaluate research. Research culture is one of those amazing things where we are the ones that govern ourselves and so we participate in these exercises as much as we are uh, subject to them as well. Um, so what I'm talking about today is for want of a better word meta impact, the impact of impact and I found this because I come from an area of research called meta research which is the research on research and yet impact is becoming a really important important tool in which to look at research's relationship to each, each other, its relationship to management, as well as its relation to the wider society as well. When we implement impact as a criterion and evaluation, what I'm trying to tell you here is that impact becomes something more than just the definition or the tool that we use to evaluate it. And I'm going to, at the end of this, at the start and at the end of this presentation, start asking you the question that is always on everyone's lips when we talk about impact, which is what is impact? Not what is impact in terms of what is impact? What do I need to put in my grant application to make sure that it is viewed positively? And so that it is viewed in a way that gives me, makes, makes it more likely that I will receive funding. Or for those people who are joining us from the UK, what type of uh, impact claims do I need to make in order to get full star impact? Mm -mm. I'm going to start talking about impact. What is impact from a cultural perspective? And taking you through these three studies that I, I have been involved in, we'll start to get an idea about what impact is culturally. First thing we need to think about is impact is an instrument. It's not a thing. Uh, well, the way it is instrumentalized or way it is operationalized through our evaluation uh, processes at the moment, how we assess it in you as researchers, as well as the projects that you submit either to an audit framework such as the UK or even through your grant application, is subject to the boundaries and the borders of its definition as defined by that particular research agency, that particular organization, or that particular country even. 
The UK, the idea of impact was perhaps started in the UK um, and was matured in the UK and manifested itself in the research, 2004, uh, research excellence framework in 2014. And the boundaries that they put on it were really quite interesting. They looked at it is an effect on change or benefit to the economy, society and culture, blah, 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 beyond academia. And so in that definition, there are already specific, uh, specific boundaries placed on its definition and how it is to be utilized within assessment. The, def the emphasis on an effect on change or benefit and its focus on outcomes, as well as the words benefit uh, or quality of life or have positive inclinations, it needs to do something good for society, as well as the barrier beyond academia. What does it do beyond our everyday work as researchers or academics? Beyond, for want of a definition, the ivory tower. And this was a little bit different. Um, sorry, and within this definition too is the idea that we're looking at outcomes. So we're looking at things, we're looking at making value judgments after the effect. And this differs from perhaps how the UK research councils, the AHRC, the ESRC, the MRC, um, all look at impact. Up until 2019, you had to have, along with every grant application, a two-page summary called Pathways to Impact, which was an idea about how in your research would contribute to some sort of societal good. Since then, it has become something that is, quote unquote, needs to be embedded into every cycle of doing research. Um, but again, we're looking at a particular instrument of operationalizing the evaluation of impact that has within itself particular uh, borders and boundaries about what is included and what is not included. In that definition, the idea that there is, um, there is excellent, uh, excellent social and economic research makes to society indicates a particular beneficiary from the impact from the research that you do. And again, there is this implicit idea of positivity impact has to be something good. In Australia, there is a little bit more of an emphasis on economic impact as well as engagement. There have been some problems in the past with operationalizing this, uh, this uh, definition within Australia, where they were talking about engagement with industry, but failed to, under failed to define what that engagement means, which means that if I take a breakfast meeting with somebody who happens to be a CEO of, uh, CEO of some company, then I can count that as engagement. And in the Netherlands too, there are particular ideas about adding value to research for society, but also uh, defining that onto regional, nationals or international levels. And the Norway, Norway um, is uh, still experimenting with its different types of um, instruments, but is looking at focusing again, as with the UK, on benefits and particularly uh, benefits on society beyond academia. And these definitions, these instruments are operationalized through the evaluation process. It's funny, and we all know as academics that we are subject to evaluation every single step of the way. And evaluation in that way is actually uh, quite an interesting uh, point in which to instigate cultural change towards perhaps differing the practice of research, the targeting of the research outcomes, as well as the translation activities that happen there. But again, there are two different types of evaluation that we need to consider when we talk about impact. And they're ex post and ex ante. And for those people like me who really don't like Latin, ex post is after the fact and ex ante is before the fact. And before we, we and uh, moving on from that, you know, because researchers like putting funny Latin words onto some things that are pretty obvious, myself included, ex ante and ex post evaluation of impact require you to have different ways of assessment, different processes of assessment. Ex ante is an evaluation that happens before the research is, uh, before the research is uh, conducted. And it, it really is really muddled up with indicators of trust and feasibility. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, but you have an idea of where it might go. You might have an idea of how you're going to get there, but we're really making a judgment about whether you are the person to do this research, receive this impact uh, more than anybody else. Ex post, on the other hand, usually happens towards the end, because research never ends, but at least after a good fair amount of time. It is very much effective when it is done periodically. Uh, and it's, it requires basically value judgments about the impacts that you have achieved already. 
And so you can see at both stages of this evaluation, one where ex ante is associated with uh, applicants for proposals by funding councils and ex post being about uh, uh, ex post evaluations such as audit frameworks such as the REF or the ERA in Australia. There are different tools in which we are being used in order to make these judgments about what projects to fund or which ones to reward and why to reward them. The problem with ex ante impact is that we are in a way assessing promises, empty, empty gestures about what might happen in the future. And at the moment, there is really no uh, ex post evaluation to hold researchers to accountable for the promises they made prior to the research beginning. And quite rightly so. The idea is that ex ante and ex post uh, research evaluation should ideally work together to get an idea about what is the capability of the research community and what uh, in terms of uh, generating impact and also to be able to, uh, to produce outcomes that are more in line with the boundaries presented by impact, the impact in instrument that I was talking about, the definitions of impact. Ex post impact, I have done a lot of research before, and this is a really interesting thing because ex post impacts really are assessments based on value judgments. How do you value 10,000 starving orphans in Africa versus 10 people in, in England suffering from diabetes. Being able to assess the impact requires you to make value de de decisions about what impact is more worthwhile than the other. And this, as you can imagine, is riddled with its own different types of biases about what is interesting. Specifically, ex post impact requires you to balance an idea about what society needs with what your research has to offer. It is the evaluator that makes the decision on one, what society needs, and you as the applicant or the report, you try to estimate what the evaluator is going to value and match it with what your research has to offer. So it is this tenuous balance between these two things when trying to evaluate, uh, make value a fair value assumption about it. I'm trying to anticipate uh, what a, an evaluator might want to know, what might want to value, and match it with what I'm capable of doing it with robust evidence. Implicit in this reaction, of course, is the idea, and it's perhaps not the most popular idea, is that independent of the instrument used to define impact at this particular point in time, impact is not impact until someone says it is. And who is that someone? It's usually the evaluator. It's the one that holds the power. It's the one that makes an adjustment, a value assessment about your impact. And of course, these biases and tendencies about these values are mediated by the provision of, of, of quantitative or other types of evidence at the time. For the research uh, impact case studies at the UK, as well as in Australia, there are specific types of evidence that are required uh, to be submitted alongside your impact case studies to verify the information that you have within. And the other thing is that this is not a perfect science. It's something that we are continually adjusting. The best example here is in the 2014 exercise of the REF, or Research Excellence Framework, the instrument used to define impact didn't include public engagement. And yet, uh, and yet the evaluators themselves knew that public engagement, even though explicitly not included in the impact definition or the instrument that they used to evaluate it, they still valued it, albeit to a lesser extent, within the evaluations. So there was room within that definition for evaluators to make their own assessments of what's valuable and what's not valuable. The result was, is that in the 2021 exercise, that explicit mention of impact or through public engagement was actually included in the definition. So the instrument is, is, um, is con continually evolving based on what we are valuing, what we value from ourselves and how we evaluate um, the, how we evaluate the outputs that we produce as a research community. Again, the people who did these evaluations, supported by quantitative evidence or not, but the people who drove these evaluations were ourselves, our peers. And I'm going to get into that in a bit. The other side of the score is ex anti impact, which is far more difficult to evaluate because you're evaluating promises in the air in a way. You know, the ex post, the rules that we use to evaluate ex post don't apply anymore because because there is no value, uh, there is no bias associated with value because the value hasn't been achieved yet. 
So what evaluators seem to do, which is not a wrong thing, is that we balance the narrative of the text in front of us with other tools that we are more adept or we are more experienced in using, such as track record, excellence, feasibility. And I admit that excellence is an extremely, extremely fluid and extremely nuanced uh, definition, but academics have been evaluating excellence in whatever form it has for a long for a long period of time. And so regardless of whether they do it correctly or not, evaluators here feel far more akin to assessing excellence than they do from impact. So what they do is they use those tools in order to uh, determine the feasibility and apply them to ex ante impact. In a way, it's about trust. Do I trust this applicant to do what they say they're going to do? Knowing that in five years time, I have no power to hold them accountable to what they say they're going to do. And I looked at this at the Research Council of Norway by combining uh, a linguistic analysis of the impact proposals. So within uh, the Research Council of Norway, there's a specific uh, uh, section called impact where people, uh, applicants need to outline the impact that they're going to go uh, in line with the instrument that they used. And I wanted to look at how they constructed a narrative. And I used uh, genre writing, which is Highland's idea of persuasive uh, dialogue. And I looked at how pattern, patterns, uh, language patterns served as credibility markers within the proposals and looked at how that affects scoring. I then matched that later on with a second stage with the observations of the panels to see how the panelists reacted to these particular credibility markers or reacted to these language pat patterns and how they used them to navigate a consensus. A consensus is really important in a panel, okay? So it's when you have a particular idea about whether this panel, this applicant is worthy of funding or not, that you use different, you start to recruit your other panel members to your particular idea through dis persuasive intercourse of dialogue to be able to see whether you can recruit them to your side and create a consensus. That consensus is what drives the opinion. And it was that process that I looked at my previous book. And I was looking at this during the panel deliberations. And I could go into a lot about the research uh, areas. And if you're interested, the, the, then please do get in contact. What we saw is the main characteristics of impact and proposals were inspirations, promises, and qualifiers. The inspirations part was like an illustrative tool that applicants use to paint a wider non-academic relevance to the project. One of the applications started with started with the with the sentence, imagine a world without children. Imagine the swings going silent. The whole idea of an inspiration is to somehow generate an emotive response from the applicant, to know what to create a sense of urgency, to create the idea that if this research isn't funded, then you're going to kill all the children in the world, basically. Although it's not going to do that. It's certainly not its intended impact. The second one was the promise. The promise was the claim that the research would have an impact to a specific users, but it was absent from any particular plan on how to get there. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to save all the children in the world, but they're going to save all the children in the world. And the third one that we saw was qualifiers. And qualifiers were, were tools that were used to ground the inspiration. So um, it's the idea of being able to give them credibility towards being able to achieve that particular outcome that, or, or to address the inspiration that they had in the narrative. The best example of this was their track record. Their track record, or if they had experience um, saving children before, then you're more likely to give them a higher score because you have a better trust that they will be able to save children, as they said in their inspiration, et cetera. And we looked at how these things were worked. In the frame, we have a combination of inspirations and promises. And the presence of the qualifier was really what determined whether or not they would have a high credibility or a low credibility as reflected in the scoring that they did. So within the frame, you have inspirations and qualifiers. If you had a frame in the presence of a qualifier, then you would achieve, then you would achieve a high credibility score that would be reflected in the scoring that you got. If you didn't have any inspiration or promises in how to qualify, aka you're like, just give me the money and I know what to do with it. Don't know what I'm going to do with it, but just give me the money because you can trust me. Then obviously you would have kind of like a mere sort of opinion and you wouldn't have any credibility. Finally, if you had all inspirations and promises, but no had no plan, no back record on which to do of it, this would seem to decrease your credibility score. And this was reflected in um, the scoring. 
what we found is that between these three ideas within these narrative these proposals, no significant difference was found between the three of them. So we thought something else is going on in the frame. And so, of course, the next thing we did was we did panel observations. We looked at the panel, which happened, of course, during 2020, 2021, which means most panels, when we are doing ethnographic, ethnographic uh, analysis, look like this. This is the Muppet Show. This is not a panel debate. It might look like what you imagine it to be, but this is not. So doing ethnography in this kind of environment is beneficial for two reasons. The first thing, I can see everyone's faces. It's amazing. It's more effective for me to be able to see how people interact both verbally as well as non-verbally when I can see them all facing myself. Whereas being in a normal panel room and sitting around a table, it's actually more difficult for me to pick these things up. The second thing is because we were in a because when this research was done, I was in a series of lockdown. It meant that my co-author and my co my postdoc was actually in a different county to me, watching this panel uh, debate, which meant that we were able to develop our um, develop our matrix of interactions uh, separately and reasonably objectively, and only then would we work out what was worthwhile and what was not by discussing it um, elsewhere. So this was a true uh, way of verifying each other's coding perspectives at the same time as benefiting from a variety of faces facing us at the particular point in time. What we found here is that in addition to the idea of the frame, and the inspirations is that the promises was actually in a, entering the assessment process as a dynamicism between um, weighing up the risks and the benefits of the project. The qualifiers still existed, the credibility still existed, but what we actually found is that within the frame, there was a constant dynamicism between assessing the risks with the benefit as well as, um, but in relation to the inspiration. And this interacted with the presence of the qualifier and affected the level of credibility. Our next step now is to take this model and try and quantify it in the next round of applications to the Research Council of Norway, which is happening in the next couple of months. But this is really interesting because this provides us with guidelines, not only for evaluators, but also applicants. Research impact cult and culture change associated uh, with uh, impact on creating impact culture works best when applicants know what evaluators are looking for. And that's not necessarily mean to overly prescribe impact within that definition. And we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to refine the impact definition or refine the instrument itself. All we wanted to do is to give evaluators specific and fair ideas in which to evaluate ex ante impact. And we saw that by providing three, three assessment uh, points that they could make their judgments about the value of the inspiration, how much do you really want a world without children? Or oh, sorry, that should be the other way around. How much do you not want a world without children? To be able to identify the qualifiers, so the track record or the things that grounded the plan. And again, in step four, to be able to uh, make the assessment about whether the inspiration that was envisaged in the application was also worth the benefits, whether well, the benefit of that was worth the risk. For applicants, it created a four-step stage in which to build their ex-ante impact frame. Build the frame. Tell me what you want to achieve. Make me cry, as I also told them. Identify the capacity that you have in order to deliver on the inspiration or else the, the capacity that your team has or else how are you going to get that capacity. And then make a clear and assess assessment of the risks as well as mediate those risks in practice. And this is actually quite useful, the Research Council of Norway, and they're actually doing it now. The other way in which we can look at the impact of impact on research culture is by looking at research careers. Specifically, I look at early career researchers uh, and their reason why is quite interesting. For early career researchers, the idea of moving within and generating impact is much easier than perhaps we understand. This is a group of people who are more adept at the interaction between technology and research, who share things in different ways, who don't necessarily are akin or socialized to a particular way of disseminating or producing research. So the idea is of, of um, academia either being a vocation or is it something that you can instrumentalize towards creating, uh, towards fulfilling an altruistic idea of, of research, i.e. I want to change the world is quite interesting. 
And yet, even though it seems to be that our early career researchers that we interviewed, and we interviewed a range of early career researchers across Europe, regardless of whether there was a formalized criterion for an impact within operation, like operation in their country or not. We, they all wanted to achieve impact. That's the reason they got into research in the first place. And yet they found it particularly difficult to, in, to mobilize what they needed to mobilize in order to achieve this goal, mainly because career progression was always top priority and workloads as well as, uh, as, well as um, uh, evaluation criteria didn't reward impact or involvement at impact at such an early stage. Impact, it seemed to be is something Thing that takes time, and this is perhaps a myth of impact as well, seems to be the prerogative of mid to late career researchers and not necessarily relevant for early career researchers who, if they wanted to achieve impact, their role was predominantly to help their mid to late career researcher uh, in, uh, achieve impact rather than to impact, achieve impact on themselves. But again, this idea of progressive expertise, aka the longer that you're in academia or one, let's take a cultural idea, the longer you survive in academia, the longer you, the more trustworthy you will be as an expert was really built into how they value the contribution that these researchers had to the wider research debates and implementation of their evidence. As this person said, the main power problem I have is experience. I am still a junior. I do not feel that I am legitimate to give any recommendations to anyone. Also because my research results are preliminary and I'm not 100% confident in them. Within this part, we see the person is again, look, not necessarily looking at impact as a progressive idea or something that can be engaged upon at an ex-ante idea, but something that they're rewarded to by achieving a difference. And they are limited by the structures, in, structures currently in play within the research culture from doing that uh, expressively. The other idea is power and agencies. Excuse me. An early career researcher does not have any power as research culture stands to change the system. They don't set the rules and the rules are not set with them in mind. The powerful make the rules. The, uh, the mid to more like late uh, career researchers make the rules based on their experience and their idea about what works and what doesn't work. For example, in the worst case scenario, it's the system worked fine for me, I'm a professor, therefore I have no incentive in which to change it. And yet impact is a progressive idea. It is something that needs time and it needs, it needs time and care and attention. And at the early stages of a career, that time and attention is not prioritized, nor is our, our researchers given the expertise in which to do it. The probably other problem is they have no agency to change it. They don't evaluate. They're rarely asked to sit on evaluation panels for ex ante or ex post impact. I can say pretty much there is no early career researcher on the research excellence framework panels at all. So they can't influence change from the middle because they can't exercise their markers of excellence and impact to reflect uh, to, of excellence of impact to, cre to, to create an idea about research impact within culture is something that is inclusive of their needs as well. Finally, there's a tension between the, the need to be mobile. The narrative around early career research is being mobile and needing to be mobile in order to produce more valuable research and to have a benefit of their individual careers on the long run, stand in stark contrast to the idea that impact and being able to impact requires, as this person said, time, patience, perseverance, and stability. If the demands of the research career are that you are mobile, sometimes across borders, uh, sometimes to the other end of the world, then this negates the ability for you to maintain the links that are necessary to achieving impact in the long term. The way that the research career is established does not reflect the values that we hold in promising the impact agenda and also in evaluating it long term. And this is a shame because as I said, these early career researchers are very, very keen to achieve impact and also very keen in experimenting new ways of realizing impact. And yet the whole way that the research culture is uh, established at the moment pre prevents them from being able to, to exercise those skills in order to achieve impact. Can I just say, achieving impact at this level, regardless of who does it, benefits everyone in the research culture. 
and yet the rules we've created to evaluate research called re research impact seem to uh, marginalize a large proportion of uh, the future of our culture as well. And the final thing that I wanted to talk about is the problems with these instruments and the dangers of what we call impact ignorance. And here I'm going to talk about grim pact. Grim pact is more than just negative impact. Grim pact is not necessarily concentrated on the production of research, but more concentrated on how it's used and who uses it, which is not always within the prerogative of the researcher who generates the evidence in the first place. And there's a lot of research that I've done in uh, on grim pact. The idea of grim pact is not new. Grim pact actually uh, grim pact appears in different forms, such as in the idea of post-truth, the idea that anecdote is more evident, is more valuable, or has more weight uh, than, uh, than facts or other forms of evidence. The also the idea that there's always uncertainty in the implementation gaps and the unintended consequences of introducing a technology to society too early. There's also epistemic risk where particular forms of knowledge are prioritized over others because they provide better explanations at the time, as well as the idea that there is an implementation gap. And within that gap, the idea that the research, the way in which the research is produced and its ideal, it's the way the outcomes it was supposed to achieve don't necessarily match what happens in, in reality. And within that gap is a risk that grim pact might occur. That research might not have the the um, research might not have the impact that you are anticipating and that we need to be uh, sensitive to that. Within all this is the idea of normal impact. Normal impact or the impact that is reflected in most of the instruments utilized by the research councils globally is I assume that there's a responsible relationship between academia and other modes and institutions of civilization. That is not always the case, okay? And it's, it's evidenced through daily activities, it's evidenced by uh, good and open communication, uh, the reduction of miscommunication, and it's all happy and slappy, but it doesn't always work that way. In our case studies of Grim Pact, we look at a different types of categories of impact. It is not just uh, research negative impact, but a perfect storm of miscommunication, lack of control, uh, disproportionate use of research or, or disingenuous research use for that is linked to political ideology, the silencing of experts and any conflicting knowledge, and the overall idea that research has or society has is that research creates the answers. And we saw this in every, well, I saw this perhaps, but I'm sure you were reflecting on it now, in every day during the COVID pandemic where the debate between what to do and what the evidence tells you to do was constantly in flux. From a research community perspective, however, there are several characteristics of the community that increase the risk of grim impact occurring. This is the violation of normal impact that I was telling you before. The idea of attribution debates, the fear that people have to be blamed for when research goes wrong, if your research culture is set up only to reward those benefits that are considered positive to society, then there is a unintentional silence of those incidents of research that don't go as planned. It is contagious and unfortunately the internet and the use of social media increases the risk of this contagion. And I knew that's a particularly wrong word to use uh, this side of the COVID pandemic, but it's, it's apt. There's also transgressions on normal academic contact, and this is not necessarily academic misconduct or um, related to the replication debate, but it's also related to the fact that some people might, some researchers might decide to act in an entrepreneurial manner in order to push their impact, and that's not considered good or normal uh, research uh, conduct. And the idea that grim pact is not necessarily serendipitous. It is something that we can predict it is something that we can uh, have warning signs for it and that we might actually be able to stop before it occurs. And this is why I talk about the risk of grim pact, not necessarily grim pact as an ex post um, outcome of impact. And the other thing that we need to measure, uh, we need to acknowledge is that not all research benefits society. And this is fine, this is totally fine. 
What is not fine is that when uh, conceptualizations and the tools that we use to value impact within our culture, as well as the tools that we use indirectly to influence our research culture, if they are blind to impact, then we are doomed to fail because we do not learn from our mistakes and we do not embrace a culture, which means that we can be open about things that went well, went did well, and things that did not went, go well in order to learn how to do things better in the future. Grimpact, what is Grimpact? Grimpact is the space between impact in its truest form and reward, where the value and the nature of the social benefits are in flux and they're contested at every point in time. It is a perfect store of things that we can, uh, can, we can foresee and we control. And the next stage of uh, impact in implementing an impact culture within institutions, as well as within research culture more broadly, is embracing an idea of impact that can go right as well as can go wrong. So I asked at the beginning, what is impact? What is impact culturally? For me, impact is a golem. And if anybody knows what a golem is, it is a, it is a fictitious creature from Jewish mythology that is, that is neither good nor it is fat and it is neither bad, but it is created by man. And when it acts well, everything it does, and when it's under control, it acts well. But when it is not under control in a period of high emotional flux or perhaps uh, 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 high, high tensions, and the story in the mythology goes that when the golem fell in love, that's when it becomes uncontrollable. So impact is really important for research culture change, but it needs to be both more fully understood as well as controlled in order for it to work for us rather than against us. So that's all I need to talk about today. If you have any questions, you can uh, DM me on Twitter or you can send me an email. I welcome all insights and I look forward to speaking to you all. So thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Gemma. I think uh, speaking of questions, there there have been a few entered in as we've been going along, and uh, we might take a quick look at them and uh, and, and see and see what what, uh, what what you think about them. Okay. So um, the first one, let's see. I'll just scroll to the top. First one is about um, can we compare impact frameworks that come from different types of institutions? Um, are they too specific and shouldn't be bundled together? I think you can. Mm. I think that you need to acknowledge that the higher ed education uh, definitions of, uh, of impact will usually reflect those that will achieve the highest gain. So it will usually reflect national ideas about impact or those ones in research funders. I think they're not necessarily bundled together, but they are into, into collected. The researchers are reward seeking animals um, and we will, we will seek uh, the behavior that gives us the higher reward. And unfortunately the ones that offer the reward are usually those funding agencies and national assessment programs. I think that my answer to that question is that we shouldn't compare impact frameworks from each of them, but I think we should ex try to extend our un understanding of impact beyond them, because I think if we start comparing them, we limit ourselves about how impact changes how we work, as well as how impact changes how we interact with society. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good answer. And I think we definitely struggle with some of that. And, and there's often a lot of kind of similarity between these different types of, of uh, institutions and how they evaluate. Oh, there's things. a huge amount of policy borrowing in the impact agenda between countries and funders, because I think it's hard. So yeah. uh, why recreate yeah. the will? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, we might just um, move on then to the next question that I see. Also there. anonymous on attendee. Oh, I know. We have this anonymous attendee has been very prolific. <laughs> so uh, uh, again, the anonymous attendee would like uh, there to be a place for ex post impact assessment that evaluates the research project against its own objectives and those of the funder rather than that of society. Well, what do you think about that one? Wouldn't that be nice if I was able to set my own KPI? <laughs> it would be excellent. Basically said, I'm going to sit here and do nothing. Mm. So anything I do is actually a benefit. Yeah, I'm... Hmm. I think that's a great idea in theory. I 
don't know what the funders would think about that idea. They are, I think we need to, I think we need to reflect on our responsibilities of research as researchers in um, mm. in that question, which is that we do have a responsibility to society as funders of our activity. Um, it is quite astounding to me that research culture is the only bastion left of public funding where research where money is allocated with very little recompense for those funds um but i think that that idea goes against all movements and all steps we have made towards greater accountability in research and responsible research practice i think it would be nice um but i think that we need to think of a bigger picture around accountability and responsibility to to yeah. society and the partnership we have with them yeah and i, I think often that you know the objectives of the funder reflect those of society anyway so a lot of the kind of objectives are have a kind of a, a trickle down through into society anyway from the funder yeah, yeah. i mean yeah trickle down societal benefit <laughs> maybe that <laughs> <laughs> I don't I know. Know. <laughs> An unfortunate <laughs> phrase maybe wouldn't that be nice <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah anyway um we won't just take a, another question then from our anonymous attendee again. Yeah, they've been listening very well. Absolutely, and really good questions. And um, could ex ante impact actually be trying to assess the desirability of the impacts proposed and the pathways to achieve them? So the values are still actually playing a part as there is consideration of both things. Mm, that would be nice. I didn't see mm. any evidence of it in my research, okay. it would be nice. Um, I think desirability is another word for inspiration in this mm. point. Um, so I think it is Ken Frank there. I mean, again, <laughs> the thing is, the problem with value assessments there is, uh, at ex ex, uh, for ex ante evaluation is that in the inspiration, the whole objective is the inspiration is to, to trigger a, an emotive response. So the evaluator mm. feels beholden to this particular project. Um, the extent to which that reflects game playing, I'm not really quite sure, but I think that um, if you put the inspiration with the benefit, the assessment of benefits and risks within the frame, and you need some presence of qualifiers, this person needs to be able to know how to do it. The same way, if we put a research proposal together, we don't put a research proposal on uh, cellular physics if we have no experience in cellular physics. So I think that we need to start thinking about how we put our impact case studies and our impact claims together in the same way that we put a research project together, academically speaking. I think that one of the myths of the impact agenda is that these are separate things, but they're the same process. They really are. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely. Um, we have a question from uh, Giovanna Lima, and uh, she'd like to hear your views on how much of impact should be attributed to the research system and to society when comparing, when compared to the researcher and its project, considering societal impact comes from the use of research results which is really up to society to decide. So that's a bit mm. of a tautology, really. Yeah. Um, Giovanna, would you be able to clarify a little bit so that I can address that? It, it seems to be. Um, I suppose. I don't know how to answer that. How much, yeah, how much comes from the system and society? Or, you know, it's it's that balance between, you know, where the impact comes from. Does it come from the surroundings or the project? Oh, I mean, I <laughs> research results as um, research results are just results. They're not evidence until they actually have a use. So mm. you need to think that our we need to stop thinking that our responsibility of researchers ends when the paper gets published. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, it's it's about translation. It's about implementation. And that goes beyond just publishing or producing the results itself. Research results are valuable, but they don't have value until you use them. So, yeah. 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 I, th I think I think I think there, there's a lot to that question. And certainly. Yeah, I, I'm interested to hearing more, though. I, I think I think so. And if uh, Giovanna, if you're still on the line, maybe if you could, you know, maybe build on, on that a little bit and we'll come back to it. OK. Um, next uh, question is from Kira Leonard, and what more can higher education institutions do to support 
research culture for early career researchers in relation to research impact? Do you think? Put it into their promotion criteria. <laughs> Okay. close the gap between what they want to achieve and what they're rewarded for achieving i mean it's as simple as that and also uh put into the promotion criteria not the achievement of impact which might take chance but the reasonable steps towards achieving it though the efforts that they do to engage needs to be more explicit in in promotion and appointment criteria for the other career researchers i think and we need to and also we're talking about research culture we need to help each other it's not just up for universities to do it for us. It's really up to how we do it for each other. And I think we forget our own agency and being able to change our own culture. If you see an early career researcher has the potential to do something great, put your own ego aside and help them. I mean, they they are they're going to be around longer than everyone else. So I, I mean, it's it's part of our obligation to each other to make sure that we empower each other to achieve the greatest impact that we have. I don't mind personally. I mean, it took me a while to get here, though. Um, it doesn't matter if it's me or someone else down the corridor. But if I can help the person down the corridor, then that's amazing as well. And I think that perhaps on the flip side, as well as putting explicit indicators of engagement and impact in the promotion criteria for early career researchers, perhaps we should be talking more about citizenship of mid and late career researchers and how we measure and reflect and, and measure, evaluate and celebrate that too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next, I have another question here, and it's from Anna <laughs> Shankar. And you noted that uh, early career researchers are expected to be mobile, so it makes no sense to have them justify the impact of their work on specific society that they find themselves. In Ireland, we have international reviewers for our grant funders. Um, would the same uh, problem apply to them? How are they to evaluate impact on Irish society and the economy? Well, Professor Shankar, <clears throat> uh, yeah, it, the same problem would occur. And I, this is not a problem that's uh, specifically noted in ECRs, but is definitely on all uh, international perspectives as well. It is very difficult for us to evaluate something without context. Um, but... Uh, I don't have any solution to that question, and perhaps we can talk about it elsewhere over a glass of gin. Uh, but um, uh, it's an interesting question that I'd like to talk to Kalpana about more in the future. I think that the problems that I, I identified in the ECR work are um, about contextualizing evaluation to career stage, as well as to the particular society that they're benefiting. That being said, there are some common um, challenges facing all countries that uh, make this a very good, but I, more evidence is to needed to how much, you know, different societal ex, uh, ex expectations from society from research differ from different country contexts. Okay, very good. And uh, we also have a question from David O'Connell, and he's wondering what your thoughts are on the the value of the benefits of taking a, a system-wide approach to impact assessment versus more narrow program or project or unit level assessments. Oh, this is this is going to go back to responsible research and assessment points. I mm -hmm. think that you should be able to evaluation should be in a shouldn't be a comparative exercise. It should be assessing something on its own merits. So that means that you can basic, I'm not answering your question. Uh, if or or, David, but I think that um, it doesn't matter what the benefits are of taking a particular approach to impact. I think that impact as well for all aspects of research evaluation should be based on the attributes of the application itself, not imposed top down. As I talked about in my talk, the, the imposition of a top down approach to defining impact is what is problematic within these systems. Um, and we do have the we do have the expertise and we do have the power to change it as evaluators in this system uh, to to practice it differently and change it that way. Good. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to go back maybe to uh, Giovanna. I know she's, oh, there she is. I see her. Yep. We need a clarification in there and, and then we can come back to some of the other questions in there. But um, Giovanna is still here and uh, um, she I, she supposes that researchers are being evaluated on the use of results 
which is a process that they don't control, um, but they control the research, uh, the pathway to impact. But if the results are not used, then uh, that is okay, up so to the that's it. If to the results decide. are not used then, that doesn't yeah. necessarily mean they won't be used in the future. There's a lot of different yeah. theories of research uptake, which mean that you've just got to wait. I was, ha okay, I'll give you an example from this. I was having a, um, a mentor discussion with one of my early career researchers in my previous organization. And this was in 2019, June, 2019. And her, I kid you not, and you know, I'm gonna say this and you're gonna know, her level of expertise was online learning, okay? And she was bemoaning the fact that she hadn't been promoted yet in comparison to another person that she recognized as on the similar level to her, which was having impact everywhere. And she was like, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And I said to her, look, you're not doing anything wrong. Your time hasn't come yet. Mm. You just need to make sure that in the meantime, you have everything in, in, in con under control and everything in place. So when the opportunity arises for you to shine and to have an impact, that you are ready to embrace it. And she spent the next 12, six months going, okay, I'm going to make sure that I've got briefs to go and that I've, I can talk on, I've got all the skills necessary to engage, to push it. And what happened in February, 2020? Bang. And she shone. It was amazing. So the idea that we don't have control over who uses our results is a fallacy. We do. It's not whether or not the results are used right then that we need to concentrate on. We publish the paper, we do the blogs, we do the, um, the radio or the TV interviews and we're all set to go, et cetera. Sometimes the society just doesn't know how to use it yet. That isn't to say that they won't use it eventually. It's just it's not the time and place. So I think that in terms of making sure that your research is used, it's not necessarily about pushing it per se, but sometimes about making sure you have the skills, the qualifiers necessary to ensure that there, that when your time comes, when kingdom streams uh, intertwine, if you want to go for parallel streams, that you're ready to jump. Some people have more time than others to do that, but I, I, there is. It's amazing. Do you think that um, Cathy, uh, who discovered the MRA, MNRA vaccine for uh, COVID, knew that it was going to be used for a pandemic? She was going to use it for cancer. Yeah. But when, but when the when the challenge arose, she was ready to jump. Um, and so, yes, we are in control of when how research is used and when we're just not in control of when. Yeah, so. yeah. I think that's that's really good advice and and very kind of heartening to everybody out there who's, who's, who's trying to make an impact yeah absolutely um we, we've got the return of the anonymous attendee oh. again um a few more questions i think there um do you see a growing emphasis on including impact assessment plans within ex ante impact yes i am and that's two mm -hmm. things mainly because um funders are explicitly asking for it. But the other thing is that the experience that we have in pushing, preparing for impact is becoming greater in the research community. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we are engaging more. We know what works for us and what works for doesn't, you know, what works for me not might not work for you, Liam, in terms of pushing research. You know, I have the perfect face for radio, but I'm not going to do a TV interview if I can possibly avoid it. Um, so yes, so um, there is more demand for that in ex ante statements, literally because the expectation for experience is now higher as well. Yeah, yeah, and uh, very good, very good. Yes, and and then just to clarify on that one, do you see you know a growing emphasis on including ex post impact assessment plans within ex ante impact claims to provide credibility for mm -hmm. assessment? against these inspirational statements do i see a growing emphasis mm. no but what i no i don't not yet because i think that there might be difficulties in asking researchers to predict the future <laughs> um, okay. about what's going to happen in their research we know that things change but the other what i am seeing is that uh, within the research spectrum the culture spectrum there are capabilities being set up to collect the information that you would assume is for the benefit of some sort of ex post evaluation. I'm talking about research fish. <laughs> what is a okay. research fish? Yeah. We don't have that here. We don't have, okay, so research <laughs> fish. 
Oh my God. Don't go to Twitter and Twitter and put in Research Fish, but Research Fish is a platform uh, that is used to, that every uh, Research Council funded um, project needs to report to every year about what impacts they've achieved. And that you have to do it up five to six years post the end of your proposal. So sometimes for a five year grant, that can mean over a 10 year period that you totally impact. Um, and it's obligatory, you have to do it, okay? That's just so they say that that's so that they can monitor their impact, but it's also creating the capabilities to hold people accountable for things that happen. It hasn't happened yet, but what I'm seeing is the is the increase in uh, digital capabilities to capture and record and monitor impact from research that is funded by the public purse. Whether it'll happen or not, don't know, but um, I'm scared it might. I don't. I wouldn't agree with it, but not ready for that problem yet. But I'm seeing. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the next uh, question is on, um, did you notice any interesting findings uh, about, say, the diversity of the reviewers that <gasps> applies to how impact is understood or valued? So is there anything there in yeah. terms of diversity? In oh, the this, is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is a moot point at the moment. Mm. Um, Don is intending to check back with me in 12 months time. Yeah, so there are very little research saying that the, the com composition of the panel changes the outcomes in any way for scientific excellence. It hasn't been done the impact. Um, and also with my research that I did with the evaluators, I looking at the panels, the panels are huge. They're like 40 evaluators each in the ref, each panel are huge. It's very difficult to attribute particular comments or particular ideas to um, protect the characteristics of individuals within that panel because of the size of the panel and the way it's organized. It's an interesting question though. I'd be interested to see if anonymous attendee wants to have further conversations about that. But yeah, it's it's an interesting point. Okay, yeah. Um, just a, there's just a, a comment there. Um, from David O'Connell about the talk, your thoughts on how the impact of human capital can be accurately captured or assessed. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to pass if I can, David, because I don't know. I, or I can tell you that in terms of impact, the, mm. one of the big changes from the Research Excellence Framework 2014 to 2021 definition, so the instrument that was used, was the inclusion of how we implemented our research and our teaching. So how we taught and, and the outcomes associated with our research informed teaching led was considered an impact. Um, on a large human capital approach or labor, labor force approach, I don't, that's not my area of expertise. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know. But yes, I anticipate that there would be. Mm. Um, but again, uh, the impact of irony investment is skilled people, and then what do they do? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so yeah. this question continues. <laughs> I, I, th I think the impact is all about human capital, to be honest, and that's where it all comes from. But yeah. maybe that's an oversimplistic view. You've got to understand, too, that skilled people, when they move from country to country, take the skills with them. And knowledge is like that. It moves with people. It's like water and sodium yeah. that just you know they they follow each other yeah. um we are doing some research a little bit of research about what kind of benefit they leave behind uh but that is still in the preliminary stages so. okay um i think we've reached our our final question then which is just um do you have any good examples of training reviewers in impact <laughs> and from an institutional perspective no i'm um, training reviewers and impact doesn't really happen okay. yet yep. uh, what does happen is calibration exercises and this happens whether they're doing ex post or ex ante which is basically they say what do you all value an impact and they work out um, uh, a matrix in which to value um, impact or assess impact through that conversation uh, training reviewers apart from giving them the instrument. Dot. I don't like training reviewers at this early stage of impact evaluation because I think it's too prescriptive and that can, as I talked about, have uh, wide ranging disadvantages on a cultural level. Um, interesting question though, you'd like to see. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I think there's just a bit of a follow on to that one as well. That, um, it's about having control over the use of research and 
the anonymous attendee wonders if um, that is discipline specific or complicated by discipline, perhaps um, for training in, in impact. So I, no. I think it's um, in, in political science and cultural policy research, uh, certain stats have been seen to take on a life of their own and be misinterpreted and misrepresented. So um, there's a reference here about the Warren, the Warwick Commission report on cultural value is an example. And um, the, the attendee is not sure if uh, some researchers have full control over how their research gets used. So I think that's a... Yeah, so this is what I'm struggling, um, grasping with, grappling with, I should say not struggling, but grappling with um, mm -hmm. certain sense of mental anxiety there. Um, in my own research about for impact, yeah. I mean, the idea that researchers don't have full control about how their research gets used. Yes, true. And at the moment, how their re researchers are told to that their research must be used at any cost. And that may, perhaps means that we rush into things or sharing knowledge that perhaps needs a little bit more care. Yes. And perhaps it's a it's it's also lack of control is also a um a drawback that we have in living in an open and democratic institutional based society. Um, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. My point is that. I don't want researchers to think I don't have any control about how my research is used, so therefore I'm not doing anything, because I think that's a bit defeatist. Perhaps there is at a point where research becomes unusable, and um, I know you say political science and cultural policy there is an example of the Warwick Commission, but I will give you another example that is perhaps uh, more international as well as uh, more flagrant, which is the MMR debate in vaccine. Um, in vaccines. Um, no, researchers don't have control over how their research gets used all the time. But a lot of that time, we do have the power to do it. And it okay. is our responsibilities as members of civil society to participate in those debates and provide expertise. That's where expertise comes in. Very good. And is there um, an inherent conflict of interest in assessing our own impact? Yeah, but who 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 else would do it? Yeah. Uh, but uh, I believe some of the funders um, do have independent yeah, assessment of impact as they do of all other aspects yeah of and i think that the idea that there's not the same rigor of impact assessments mm. to research is, is not true i mean looking and working with these evaluators they're they're invested in the approach and they're yeah. trying to work out the best way to do it there is no rigor to scientific assessment either and <laughs> to assume such as perhaps um itself uh not 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 honest either yeah. Um, we know that we know more more men get funded than women. We know that um, if you're white, you're more likely to get funded than if you're from a BAME background. We know that there is no rigor to um, research assistance assessment. Then we can't hide behind claims of meritocracy because it, it doesn't always apply. So um, all I know is that there are good people who are our colleagues who are in that dis room making decisions for the be benefit of science, society, and ourselves. Um, I just hope that we can train them or convince them to act kinder um, and to alter their assessment processes accordingly. And this is even more valuable when we're talking about assessing how much we contribute to society. Okay, I, I think we've reached the end of our uh, questions and answers session then. So I think this concludes our seminar really. And I'd like very much to thank my colleague David Bennett, who um, organized the session. Thanks, David. And uh, also very much thank you to Gemma for her excellent presentation and for answering all our questions today. And finally, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending and I hope you enjoyed today's seminar. So thanks very much, all. Thanks so much, everyone. Look forward to meeting you in person very, very soon. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye, everyone, bye. -bye. bye, everyone. bye.